at Lely Presbyterian Church of Naples. We thank you for joining us for this online service. And if you are worshiping now with us or if you're watching one of the recordings of this on YouTube, uh, we uh, welcome you and we are very glad that you are with us. Um, want to announce oh, that- Can you turn it up a little bit? We can't hear you. We want to announce that there will be a congregational meeting uh, following worship this morning, as has been announced for the last two weeks. And that congregation meeting will be for uh, repurposing uh, the work of our pulpit nominating committee and moving it from a designated uh, search to a, a regular pastor search and we will also be doing an election for some deacons. Um, we're going to have Bible study again on Tuesday at 11 a.m. and we're going to work uh, on Psalm 34. If you're interested uh, in participating in that, please send me an email so I can make sure you get the connection for uh, the Zoom uh, Bible study. Also, next Sunday is the first Sunday of August, and so we will be celebrating communion. And uh, would ask that you have ready with you bread and uh, juice or wine, or, uh, so that when we get to that part of the service, uh, you can participate. Let us now show our joy in being together, singing There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Sherry will now lead us in the call to worship. Let us love the Lord, because the Lord has heard our voices and our supplications, because the ear of the Lord has been inclined to us. Let us enter into God's presence and praise the Lord forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship singing, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing. 
Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Sherry will now lead us through the process of confession. Friends, in, G in Jesus, God has given us a new way into God's holy presence. Let us enter in Jesus' way and pray our confession together. Gracious God, we come seeking forgiveness for all the sins we have committed against you and against others. We come in the name of Jesus, and so we dare to ask your pardon. Give us pure hearts and a right spirit that we might worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now hear the assurance of pardon. Friends, our eternal God is the author of our lives and the end of our journey. Hear and believe the good news, Jesus Christ, the word of God, we are forgiven and made whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. And let us show our joy singing the Gloria Patri. <laughs> As the peace of Christ has been given to us, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you always. Peace be with you. Will, can you turn it up again, please? Okay, is that better? There you go. Yes, thank you. Let us continue now with our morning prayer, which we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious and Loving God, we thank you that you are with us no matter how we gather and that we are with each other in the power of your Holy Spirit that is not bound by space or distance or electronic connection. So we give you thanks that we can raise our praise and our glory and our thanksgiving to you for the bounty and the goodness that you have given us in our lives. We thank you, O Lord, for this community of faith, for Laley Presbyterian Church and all of the faithful people within it, for its leaders and servants, for those who seek to serve in the community in the name of your Son. We pray, O Lord, for the church, the Presbyterian Church USA, and for the church universal, and pray that through the church, the witness of your love and grace, the good news of your gospel might be shared with all. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are ill, for those who are suffering both from COVID-19, but also from those who are suffering from the usual ailments that we have with us all of the time. And we pray that you would be with those who are frightened or lonely or confused and pray that you would uh, help us 
be your voice and your hands loving and greeting one another. We pray for all of the different crises in our nation. And we pray, O oh Lord, for peace and peace with justice. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with our leadership and give them your wisdom and your guidance and that they would be responsive to what they receive from you. We pray, O oh Lord, that in this day, we might have our hopes sustained and even strengthened because we know that we are your children and that you love us and that you care for us and surround us and show your face to us through each other's faces. So we ask, O oh Lord, for your blessing. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, Our Father who Lord, art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give us this Here's day this our day. daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now move to our scripture readings, and as Sherry will begin with the first reading. The first reading is taken from the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse, um, and we'll continue on to like verse 50 or so with breaks of some verses that um, aren't a part of this particular uh, message. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. 
It is the smallest of all of the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus told the crowds all of these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the earth. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, and in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of God is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew to shore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, yes. And Jesus said to him, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we have heard these words read from your scriptures and pray that our hearts and our minds might be open to them. And pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my lips might be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My favorite class that I ever took was a class in parables. It was taught by a Jesuit priest, a Jesuit priest that we called behind his back the Pillsbury Muffin Man because he would just sort of looked inflated. And he was such a wonderful teacher and so dedicated uh, to his students and to all of us and made these parables just such powerful and exciting things. So these parables, as many parables are, are about the kingdom of God. And, and they are about what a great treasure the kingdom of God is and that how it is worth our giving everything we have to receive the kingdom of God. Now, it said in that passage that Jesus taught in parables, and without a parable, he didn't teach anything. And so we need to have a little bit of understanding of what a parable is, because a parable is not just an analogy or a metaphor. A parable is something that has a power and a twist in its own self. Parables surprise us. They are supposed to surprise us. And if you're reading one of Jesus' parables and nothing surprises you, go back and read it again because you've missed something. And probably what you've missed is the very point that Jesus was trying to get. We get surprised in Jesus' parables and we get pushed out of the regular way that we think about things. We our insight gets transformed and we understand in a new way how what appears to us to be very fragile is in fact something of power and that things that we think are of power are in fact not of power. A parable not only gives us new insight out of those surprises, but it also hooks us. It requires us to make a decision. 
some kind or other, either a decision to agree or a decision not to agree, a decision to act or not to act. And these parables that Jesus uses to teach about the kingdom of God are, are perfect illustrations of all of those points. First of all, Jesus doesn't choose the things of might in the world. He doesn't tell parables really about kings and, and generals. He tells stories about normal people, and he tells stories about normal things that were especially known in the agricultural and trading culture of his time. He talks about the kingdom of God using the mustard seed and somebody who plants it. He talks about yeast and a woman who uses it. He talks about hidden treasure and the person who rehides it. He talks about the pearl of ultimate value that the merchant buys. Now the surprise is, and this we often don't get because we think of the mustard seed as a symbol of faith. And so for us, to us, it is this wonderful thing, but to the people of Jesus' time, the mustard seed, the mustard was an invasive plant. It isn't the kind of plant that was grown agriculturally. I grew up in India where there were vast fields that could stretch to as far as you could see of yellow mustard growing, but it only grew up to three and a half or four feet. It didn't, it didn't grow like the mustard that Jesus is talking about. It is like going out and planting kudzu on purpose in the middle of your field. And so the people of Jesus' day would have said, what in the world? How, how can the kingdom of God be like a mustard seed? And why would anybody plant this terrible plant on purpose? Because it spreads out and it grows up and it takes the light. And, and it's just a very messy, messy thing that is hard uh, to get rid of. I know that my wife and I once planted a bunch of mint. And no matter how hard we tried, we never got rid of that mint after that. It just kept spreading and spreading. The great growth that Jesus is talking about is normally the problem about mustard seeds. They start very small, but they grow huge. They take over a part of a field and, and they're invasive and, and terrible and nobody wants them to grow very great. So why did someone, we are told, plant mustard seed? Well, when Jesus is explaining this, and the answer is that, that even the birds of the air need a place to nest. And so what we are called to look at in this parable is to look at it from a completely point of view, to think about how God cares for every creature on earth and every person on earth. And God needs to provide something for all creatures and all people. And so this seed is planted and becomes a home for the birds. God has a different perspective, and the earth is not just for people. And think of the yeast. In those days, it didn't come in handy packets. It was made up of deliberately spoiled bread that had yeast in it. And you had to be very careful with this spoiled bread that you needed to keep so you could put a tiny bit of it into uh, the next batch of bread that you were trying to make, because if you didn't spoil it enough, it wouldn't have the power to raise the bread. And if you spoiled it too much, it could poison your food. Now, we're told in this case that the woman has made yeast, and she takes a little bit of it, and she puts it in five measures of wheat, and what we're told by the commentators is this is like enough bread for a wedding feast. This is a huge amount that comes from, again, just this little bit of uh, yeast. 
The third thing is the hidden treasure that someone finds in someone else's field and rehides it and goes and sells everything he has so he can buy that field so the treasure will then be his. But think about this for a minute, because what is he doing looking in someone else's field in the first place? And why doesn't he tell that someone else about his good fortune that he's got a treasure in his field? And why does he go and trick the man into selling the field for the value of the property of the field and not including the treasure? He is, in effect, by the law of the time, a thief. He was doing what he was not permitted to do. And why would Jesus present to us a person of that character as some kind of role model in a parable? And it's sort of, Jesus did this in parables. He used negative role models, which if even a thief can figure out how to get the great treasure, how can you who are not thieves not be smart enough to sell what you have to get what is important? And it's sort of the same way with the pearl of great price. We, we like pearls. Um, we, we would love to have a one of great beauty, and we would probably pay considerable amounts if we had it, to buy it, but this merchant that's talked about here sells everything and buys this one pearl. Now, first of all, merchants were not held in great respect. There was no uh, sort of truth in lending kind of uh, rules or, or truth in fairness in commerce kind of rules. And uh, it, it was fine for the merchant to say anything that he could in order to trick you into buying what he was selling at a higher price. And so here's this merchant that's kind of shady just to start with because he's a merchant. You, you really couldn't trust a word he said, but he goes and buys one pearl and now he's out of business. He made his profit by selling many pearls. This is like, like Henry Ford selling many cars, and now he's down to one car, and if, if he can sell that for a vast fortune, then, then he's all right, but otherwise he owns this great pearl and no way to earn his bread. But even this merchant has been smart enough to give what he has to get what is valuable which is what makes it like the kingdom of God. Why did Jesus choose to equate the kingdom of God with uh, someone who wants to buy a field and a merchant and a thief and a woman? Uh, that was quite unusual that Jesus would be using a woman in that as if that were the role that he were playing. The parables show that from Jesus' perspective, the treasure of God is to be found in every nook and cranny of daily common life, as the commentator says. Jesus is trying to teach us, in teaching us the parables about the kingdom of God, not to go looking at the great cathedrals, which are wonderful to see, but to look all around us, to look close to look at our own lives because the signs of the kingdom of God are near to us. The next, uh, all of this makes me, me think about that behind all of these parables about the kingdom of God, there is another way of thinking about this, and that is that not only are we to look at the commonplace, but we are to look at ourselves, and that the kingdom of God is like God looking at us and seeing us to be treasures of great value. 
treasures of so much value that God gives his son to redeem us, to make us his own again. The kingdom of God is within us. In the next section of these parables, we hear about the parable of the net. And this is a scene that I've actually participated in, again, in, in India, along the coast of the Bay of Bengal near Gopalpur. And they had these boats that were probably 30 feet long, and they were made of big curved planks, and they literally sewed them together with tar and straw in between the boards. And then they went out up to five miles, and they would put out a net, and then they would pull that net into the shore. And whatever got caught in that net was what they got. And when they got to the shore, the fishermen would jump out, and a couple of them would stay in the water to splash and scare the fish back into the net if they were escaping from the mouth. And others would jump out and grab the rope that had been tied to the tail of the boat, and they would begin hauling it up the sand. Now, we were there as in a vacation role, but every time we saw that, we three boys and my family, my father, we would all go and run and jump and pull on that uh, net rope with them until they got it all up out of the water where they could deal with the fish. And then they did exactly what Jesus talks about in this parable. They got baskets and they sorted the fish into different baskets, and some of the baskets went into the back of a truck, which would go off to the big city, and some of the fish went into baskets that were tied on the back of bicycles and went to closer uh, fish. But it was, it was up to the fishermen to do the sorting and to decide which fish were good and which were not. And so the question arose, which are you? Are you, are you a good fish? Are you on the side of good fish? Or are you on the side of a bad fish? In, in our postlude today, we, we are, are going to hear a medley that is played that includes both uh, Go Down Moses and Which Side Are You On, which comes out of the coal fields of Harlan Kentucky as unionization had to happen to protect the lives and rights of workers. The question is, whose side are you on? And that side, that question becomes the question of the kingdom of God. Whose side are we going to be choose to choose on? Now, an interesting thing is that Jesus goes right from talking about the net and the sorting that the fishermen do to talking about people and our need to be sorted according to whether we are good people of God or we are not good people. But he is very clear to us that it is not our role to judge which side someone else is on. That will be up to the angels, he said, to sort us out. And we do not sort one another. And then he goes on and moves to something else that, at least for Christians, would be of surprise, I think, that he lifts up the scribes as people who study the treasures of the faith and who keep that which is good in the faith and lift it up, and then they examine what is new to the faith and what is good they incorporate and also lift up, and they present it to the rest of us. In my doctor of ministry group at Princeton, we had a, a rabbi, a reformed rabbi, and he was explaining to us the differences between rabbis and priests and, and Protestant ministers, and he said, our main function is to help our people approach, understand, and live the law. Well, that's not quite the way we would see it, and the rabbis are in many sense 
the followers of the scribes, but we Christians are used to hearing and thinking about scribes and Pharisees, scribes and Sadducees. We're not used to thinking about scribes as helpful, devoted people who study, spend their lives studying and becoming expert in the scripture and in how to help people apply it in their lives. And so Jesus says, the scribes that are trained for the kingdom of God will have the task of bringing out the treasures, bringing out treasures from the old law, from the traditions, and bringing in the new treasures from the teaching of God and helping people sort that all out. Not doing it for them, but helping them do what it is. Now, remember that Jesus said that he came not to obliterate the law, but to fulfill the law. He came not to make the law irrelevant, but to make the law be of grace. When we are bringing out what is new or noteworthy, we are doing what I remember my professor, other professor, one of my other professors in seminary, Edward Farley saying about what I and other students were doing in seminary. And what he said to us, you are not being trained to be the theologians for the congregation you serve. And we were quite surprised by that because we thought that's precisely what we were being trained to be. And he said, no, you are not to be the theologians for the church. You are to be the trainers of the theologians who are all of the people of the church. The kingdom of God is found in the common. The kingdom of God is not something for any of us to impose on someone else. The kingdom of God is for us as people who are scribes to help people who are the people who live the faith to look at the scripture and to find what is good and uplifting and strengthening to them so that they can share it and train other people to be theologians, ones who seek to understand and to love and to service God. I pray for us that that will be what we all can do and that we take advantage of this time of, of isolation and we take the time for us to go back and look at the treasures that we find in scripture and we find in the experience we've had of God in our life. Because Jesus would tell you, your life is chock full of the kingdom of God. Just look for it. Amen. Let us now continue um, in our worship by singing Spirit of the Living God.
Sherry will now lead us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us sing now the hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. go knowing that you are a treasure in the eyes of God and that God has given what is most precious to him for you and for me. Go now in peace and may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. Let us sing our congregational response. to thank you all for being a part of the worship today and pray that this worship may have been a blessing for you and that you feel included in this family of faith because this is a group of people who believe that Christ's grace extends to others and you would strengthen us by your participation with us. I want to announce again that after the postlude, we will be having a special called congregational uh, meeting.